So, yeah. Yeah, Kirit has a comment here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kirit. That's I'm blessed and encouraged to hear that. Glory to God. Yes. Okay, so yeah, so we will uh, proceed. So we have seen how Jesus talks about being born again as a spiritual uh, activity uh, done by the Spirit of God. And the results are also observed later. So in that moment, the spirit man is born again. We become a new creation in Christ. But that life of the spirit, uh, that is demonstrated. So the effects of the wind, the work of the spirit, is seen in a born again person's life. Okay, and uh, we can say that about so many people, you know, even ourselves. When we were not born again, our life was very different. But a true work of the spirit, when it got done in our lives, something changed. And the effect of that, the life that we uh, started living after that was so different. So God is, uh, Jesus is explaining this to Nicodemus, that it is a spiritual activity. Now Nicodemus answers, and he says, how can these things be? Then Jesus is, uh, you know, kind of looking at him and saying, look, uh, you are a teacher, right? You are a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what, speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. So uh, once again, you know, Jesus is helping Nicodemus see the truth, the truth about God's redemptive work, the truth about a new life which he can have, and also the truth about the Holy Spirit, his work, uh, and the truth about himself being the Son of God. So it seems like even after the explanation that Jesus gave Nicodemus, maybe he understood the uh, Holy Spirit, work of the Holy Spirit. That's what born again is. It's uh, I should be a new person, and that is possible only by the Holy Spirit, then I can enter the kingdom of God. But being a teacher, because here Jesus points that out and says, look, you're a teacher. You already know a lot of spiritual things. And yet there is a resistance. Okay, So there, there was something inside Nicodemus where he was not ready to accept the truth of God's word. And Jesus understood that. And he said, come on, I'm telling you in plain words, because I know what question you're asking. You want to know whether I'm the Messiah. I'm telling you, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. So he's trying to tell him, you have found the answer. I am the answer. Can you accept it? But Nicodemus is struggling. You know, it's so sad, right? Like we can know the word of God. We can know the truth of God's word. And yet, what, what is the, the main theme of the Bible? You know, it talks about God. It talks about what God has done for us. It talks about Christ. So uh, like, you know, when we have just the study of uh, the scriptures in a sort of an intellectual way or just the, the I mean, you view it for the history, you view it for the uh, some good principles, insights, and that's it. You refuse to see God in the scriptures. That's very sad. So Jesus was trying to address that issue with Nicodemus and he's trying to say, look, I'm the one 
you that you need if you want to enter the kingdom of god you must be born again but nicodemus he is not able to accept it okay so uh did nicodemus actually go on to accepting uh, christ like we really don't know because again you know in the bible itself we don't have any uh, uh, any concrete information that tells us now maybe in his lifetime he would have responded sometime later or maybe it was too difficult for him to give up uh, his position and uh, you know his point of view but you know god reveals to nicodemus that he is the messiah that he has come from heaven now he adds to it and he says and as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life now this is like a type and shadow you know you recall in the book of hebrews it's there lots of types shadows where in the old testament you have something uh that reveals what god is going to fulfill in the new testament so there was a time when the children of israel were being bitten by serpents but to save them god gave moses the instruction to raise up a bronze serpent serpent is usually an image of satan but in this case you know you you see a serpent being used um in you, you, like in that uh, bronze you know that bronze image a serpent is being used but that is actually talking about uh the judgment that god is going to um the judgment over satan because bronze is a symbol of judgment so basically god is saying i'm just going to judge uh the enemy and uh, the people will be saved okay so in the same way we know that later on jesus hung on the cross and when the son of man lift, lifted up he drew all men to himself so eternal life is being promised so jesus is trying to tell nicodemus look i have come here like that bronze serpent which the way it was lifted up and people were healed when i die people are going to be saved okay and uh, uh, you can depend on that i'm here to give you eternal life he continues on to say why did god plan this why did god uh, plan to release life through the cross because god so loved the world is the world a wicked place yes it got corrupted by sin and the hearts of the people uh, were so evil towards god and yet we see here that god loves the world so what did he do as a demonstration of his love god gave okay so you know you you see that god gave his best his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life so there is so much just in that one verse that god's love was demonstrated in his giving of his best gift uh, which is the son of god jesus is talking about himself that god has given and he's telling nicodemus if you believe in me you will not perish or the end of this physical life will not be the end you will not perish in hell you will not you know uh, uh, be separated from god but you will have everlasting life you know everlasting life uh, uh, is it's like you will live on you will live on into eternity in relationship with god and that is what god is offering uh, to you nicodemus okay and then you know he goes on to touching many other uh, inside uh, truths uh, and providing insight so he says for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world so god is making it very clear that the reason jesus came was for love it was not to put people down 
he came so that it says but that the world through him might be saved so what is the purpose of the uh, coming of the savior it is to save the world and he says how to receive of this this uh, uh, saving that the lord has done believe he who believes in this christ is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already so when we don't believe that's when you know we uh, like opposite of saved is condemned right if we are not uh, it's like saying when it's raining if you don't stand under the umbrella you will get wet so stand under the umbrella you be saved otherwise you will be condemned if you don't accept the work of god which has been done to protect then you will be exposed to the uh, consequences of sin and uh, uh, you know which leads to eternal condemnation yeah so that is something jesus is pointing out and he is also you know, sharing how the world is a place that loves darkness we've seen this even in john chapter 1 you no know, god has done so much he has loved us he uh, has given his son to become a sacrifice and yet jesus says men love darkness rather than light so it what, what does it say you see the the tendency of the flesh okay is sin unless the person is born again because once we are born again the power of sin is broken on our lives okay and we are able to appreciate the kingdom of god and the truth of the kingdom of god but uh if we don't accept it you know we continue in that sin and then we are not able to receive of the things of god and we are walking in darkness so uh, he says see god has done all this and yet men love darkness rather than light he says uh why why is he saying that they love darkness because they are walking in evil things practicing evil okay uh, and yeah, that is not a good thing but uh, he says these things the evil things will be exposed by the light okay but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in god but those who accept those who walk in the truth so they uh, are walking in righteousness okay now moving on after these things uh, jesus and his disciples they came into the land of judea and they stayed there uh, he, he remained with the disciples uh, and baptized but at the same time john the baptist you know we met john the baptist earlier in chapter 1 and again john the baptist in chapter 3 uh, here and he is doing his work which is baptizing people unto repentance so he continues to do that so what happens at that point is that there is some kind of an argument or a, a disagreement between john the baptist excuse me john the baptist and the jews okay now what is the issue for them to argue you know, that is not presented here uh, but there seems to have been you know some argument which they had and then uh, we notice that the disciples of john okay, they come to him and they say teacher uh, he he who was with you beyond jordan which is jesus to whom you have testified behold he is baptizing and all are coming to him so disciples are telling john's disciples are telling look we are noticing this about jesus that uh, he is also baptizing and people are going to him so it's like competition what do we do now because you are somebody who is baptizing and we should be getting people here but there are people who are going to jesus now what to do so john you know one good thing about john is john knows his identity remember he said that uh, he has come to prepare the way he says i am not the messiah but christ is the messiah and i am not even worthy enough to loosen his uh, sandal straps so 
John knows his exact position and you see the heart of a worshipper in John the Baptist. So then the disciples come and say, look, we have competition. Jesus is also baptizing. Then John tells them, look, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. So what is John saying? John is clarifying to the disciples and saying, he's the Messiah. Heaven has decided whatever heaven gives only that we can receive. So heaven has already decided that I am just someone who is sent before the Messiah. But yes, it is Jesus who is the Messiah. So earlier also, when John pointed out, we said that uh, you know, people followed, right? John, John said that, uh, see, this is the Messiah. And the moment he introduced Jesus, John's disciples became Jesus' disciples. But John was happy about it. So it shows us how ministry should be. Always recognizing God for who he is, giving him honor and glory, and not feeling jealous. Okay, people are going behind Jesus, not behind me. But he exalts Jesus. And he also says that the church belongs to Jesus because he is the bridegroom. Okay, but John introduces himself as just a friend of the bridegroom. So he's quite clear about it. He does not want the glory or he does not want uh, uh, the, the, you know, like he is not trying to show his authority over the church because he understands that he's just a minister or he's just a, a servant of God. And he's happy to see Jesus taking the main position. And he says, therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. So he's rejoicing uh, in the fact that he is associated with the Messiah. That's it, right? That itself makes him so happy. Uh, and he says, he must increase, but I must decrease. So the prominence that is given is given to Jesus. Now you compare this with uh, what the people were doing in the temple. What is John doing? John is worshipping. In worship, what do we do? We surrender. We humble ourselves. Okay. So that's what John is doing. He's saying, okay, you know, he it has been given from heaven. He is the bridegroom. I'm not the Christ. I was I was just sent before him. But he must increase. I must decrease. So he's surrendering, humbling himself, worshiping God, honoring God. And when the disciples look at Jesus as a competition, he's clarifying, you know what? He is the main person. We are the side people. Please try to understand. And there's no question of competition. If he's baptizing, you know, let him just do it. And then again, John clarifies. He says, he who comes from above is from above. He is above all. So again, giving Christ the position of deity. You know, he who comes from above. And earlier he said, if heaven gives something, that's it. So he's recognizing that Jesus is the son of God who has left behind his glory. He has come from above, meaning what above? From the sky? No, from heaven. He has come from the heavens. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. So again, he's saying origin, origin of uh, you know, this Jesus, obviously there's no origin because he has no beginning, right? He is the beginning. Uh, but how did he come to the earth? He's saying, in that sense, his origin is not from the earth. It is from heaven. So he's coming from eternity into, you know, this, this, um, world that is that is limited by time but he's saying Jesus is the Messiah he's come from heaven he's come from eternity okay and what 
He has seen and heard that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. So you know, he he just validates, and he says that you believe in Jesus. Whatever things he's saying, whatever things he's doing, you put your faith in that because that's the only thing that can save you. You know, Jesus also said that, right? He said that uh, um, he has come to save. That one must be born again. Put your faith. Believe. Believe in this Christ, and that is how we are. We receive salvation. So John is also encouraging his disciples to follow after Jesus. Again, uh, he continues about Jesus and his testimony. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. Remember how Jesus uh, uh, has made these statements. Said, "I speak nothing of myself." but only what i hear the father say so john understands these things and he says that you know it's only god who has sent jesus and jesus is speaking the words of the father and god gives spirit god does not give the spirit by measure so he's talking about the words of god in the mouth of jesus but also notice jesus himself is the word he is the word okay he's speaking the words of the father and he himself is the word and about the holy spirit over the life of jesus we are told that the anointing on his life it is without measure meaning there's no limit to the anointing which jesus carried okay so every anointing every anointing was in his life that is the understanding of this okay uh, so the spirit god did not give him little bit of the anointing or the the work of the spirit or the empowering of the spirit in his life but it was without measure so who is that one person who walked with great anointing it was the lord jesus christ he says the father loves the son and has given all things into his hand okay so this talks about the love within the godhead the trinity is there competition no the father loves the son so it's a bond of love it's a bond of harmony it's a bond of cooperation and because the father loves the son what has he done he has given all things into his hand so all things belong to jesus what is john doing apostle john now is writing similar to how he wrote in john chapter 1 okay deep truth about the trinity is coming out here the father loves the son he has given all things to him so all authority all authority given everything into his hand all authority has been given to the lord jesus everything belongs the book of colossians we read all things belong to him right everything is in him it's from him only so everything is in christ jesus he who believes in the son has everlasting life so again salvation what is the main thing that we need for salvation to believe when we believe in jesus we have everlasting life and he who does not believe the son shall not see life but the wrath of god abides on him so eternal destiny of man you know, we talk about heaven and hell one of the main teachings in the life of jesus he preached the kingdom of god he also spoke a lot about heaven and hell so what is the destiny of those who believe in the son of god we know that uh, we will be saved from our sins and we will live with god in heaven forever but those who do not receive salvation through faith it is the wrath of god so hell uh, is is that eternal place where the wrath of god is going to uh, affect the people so those who don't believe you know they are condemned to hell 
So uh, these truths are coming out. Even John the Baptist was aware of the Messiah. And he's trying to tell his disciples, you know what? You don't look at Jesus as a competition, but try to understand who he is. He is the Messiah. He has been sent from heaven. If you believe in him, you will have everlasting life. You will escape the wrath of hell. So John the Baptist is exalting Jesus. Now, we will proceed further into chapter 4 here. Chapter 4 has a couple of uh, incidents. And let's see what we can learn from these incidents. So at the beginning of chapter 4, uh, Jesus, you know, from where he is right now, he moves out of Judea and he goes towards Galilee. Okay. Uh, but he goes through a place called Samaria. Why does he do this? He does this because the Pharisees had heard about Jesus. Um, and, you know, maybe just like uh, John and his disciples, uh, even the Pharisees had, they must have developed envy and jealousy and wondered how come this person is gaining uh, such popularity in a short period of time. So he does not want to create trouble for himself. So Jesus is also very wise. When he understood that the atmosphere is not very good here, he decides to go to Galilee, but he is going via Samaria. So let's see what happens as he moves towards Galilee. So he came to a city of Samaria, uh, which is called uh, Sikkar, uh, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Okay, so it's a basically it's a historic, it's a place of historical importance. So Jacob had given it to his son Joseph. And if you look up, you know, what are the other things that happened in that place, you will notice that you know uh, Abraham had come there. You know, Jacob had uh, uh, moved through that place, and Jacob bought a place, uh, a piece of land over there for some money. Jacob had built an altar. So, you know, a couple of things had happened in that place. So it has importance. And Jacob gave that place to his son, Joseph. And also there was a well there, Jacob's well. Okay, it was, uh, uh, what do you call, like, uh, again, of historical importance. Now there, being wearied, wearied from his journey. Wow. Just now, in the earlier passage, we saw how Jesus is from above. He who is from above. So he is the son of God. So he's fully God. That we've understood. And the spirit is given to him without measure. God does not give the spirit by measure. Okay, we've understood that Jesus is uh, God and he is filled with the Holy Spirit. Just look at this. This uh, statement, being wearied from his journey, how can the son of God, who is so anointed, become tired through travel? So it explains to us, Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully man. Obviously, a human being will feel tired, right? So. In that sense, Jesus was very limited on the earth. So he has become tired and he sat by the well because he's he's also he's not working like that, that heavenly glory with which you know he can do wonders. He never carried any of that. He came here only as a man. So he needed the Holy Spirit to do the miracles through him. And only as a man he's experiencing the uh, limitations of being a man. So he's sitting there and he's feeling very tired. And obviously, we know we're talking about the Middle East. So it must have been very hot. Okay. And uh, at this point, Jesus is tired and he wants some water to drink. So, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. This is like a common well. You know, those days you had a common well where people would come and draw water from that same place. So some woman, she comes and uh, Jesus asks her because he's so tired. He says, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away 
into the city to buy food so think about this jesus is needing food and water to feel better so he was a human being just like us then the woman said to him how is it that you being a jew you ask a drink from me a samaritan woman for the jews have no dealings with samaritans so we have to understand that those days they had some biases uh, between communities samaritans were known as a mixed breed they were partly jew but they also had you know some other blood in them uh, and the pure jews did not regard the samaritans because of this mixture so in fact the samaritans were considered lower by the jews and that's why this lady is surprised uh, maybe it was as if a jew would go thirsty you no know, die thirsty but not take water from a samaritan but jesus very interesting he asks for water and he is asking for water from a samaritan and that to a samaritan woman okay so apparently you know in those times even women were not considered uh, you know like like they were not honored as much as men so it's amazing that jesus spoke to a woman and asked her to give water and jesus said to her you don't understand who i am say the way he spoke to nicodemus the core issue for nicodemus was to know the messiah now jesus got another opportunity here here is a lady what is her core issue she also needs the savior so he goes straight to the point if he says if you know the gift of god and who it is who says to you give me a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water so he's pointing in that direction and he's saying woman i know right now i am a mortal and i'm asking you for physical water but actually i am you know the one if you drink of me you will never thirst because i am that living water okay actually i am that living water that you need so he is trying to tell her you don't understand who i am i am the one who can give you eternal water which can satisfy your deepest thirst so the woman is confused just like nicodemus how can somebody go into the mother's womb and be born again same way the woman responds here confused sir you have nothing to draw water with so jesus what are you talking who gift of god uh, he will give you water living water but you don't even have you know uh, a pot to draw the water with and the well is so deep <laughs> where then do you get this living water are you greater than our father jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock so she has a question she is also thinking in the worldly way and she is saying it's not practical how can you give me living water from the well so jesus addresses this spiritually she is asking practical question she is answering spiritual way whoever drinks of this water will thirst again but whoever drinks of the water that i shall give him will never thirst but the water that i shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into eternal life the woman said to him sir give me this water that i may not thirst nor come here to drop okay so jesus is pointing her to eternal water or living water that can give eternal life so from the natural subject of water jesus is going to a spiritual subject so you know many a time this passage about jesus talking to the samaritan woman is used to um uh, describe evangelism how do you do evangelism we meet people everywhere we go and uh, we can meet them 
in certain circumstances so we use that natural circumstance obviously led by the spirit of god we can use that same topic to introduce them to spiritual things okay so here the topic is water and jesus he asked for water and then through that subject he is saying look actually you are the one who needs you know living water if you live, take that living water uh, you will never thirst again and then you know that will become a spring of water it springs into eternal life within you so she became hungry for the spiritual truth so from something natural he guided her to himself and this is the way in which evangelism should be done where maybe somebody is talking to us about um, mm, uh you know i don't know the suffering in the world or uh, uh people people need a better life uh, or uh, i mean so many subjects right when we speak to people so whatever it is we through that as we're talking engaging with them we introduce them and say yes there is suffering in the world but you know there is a savior uh you know yes people need a better life and jesus has come to to give that better life not just in this world but even into eternity so in that way we can present the gospel or we can present the uh, truth about jesus as the messiah and um, the way jesus ministered to this lady god is able to minister to the hearts of the people we just have to do our part and then of course it is the work of the holy spirit to convict them and for them to respond with belief okay so now jesus is continuing ministering to her she has become thirsty for the living water and then jesus ministers by the holy spirit again and he says it's like a trick statement he says go call your husband and come here okay but when jesus made this statement it opened up the reality about her life so the woman was so amazed and she gave the right answer she said yeah i don't have i don't have a husband then jesus said correct you have said the truth because you have had five husbands and the one with whom you are now uh he is not your husband so you're saying the truth so the woman understands ah i'm not talking to an ordinary person but here is somebody who is speaking by the revelation of the holy spirit so she says i think i understand that you are a prophet so how is evangelism happening in this case one is from the subject that the person understands we are introducing christ second is we can also move by the revel by the work of the holy spirit so what exactly is the gift okay what gift is this which gift of the holy spirit is this that jesus is uh, functioning in when he asks the question uh, where is your husband so what gift is this which gift of the holy spirit okay great okay so kiran is saying knowledge that's right yes so this is the gift of knowledge okay where there is no way somebody coming from judea can know about the life of a lady in samaria and suddenly she comes to the well it's not like you know jesus is pre planned and he knows about her he doesn't know anything but holy spirit reveals and he asks the right question who call your husband and reveals to her that god knows about her life okay uh, and the moment that happens the moment the supernatural power of god is demonstrated the woman comes around and she says oh wow i'm talking to a prophet and so she starts speaking in a spiritual way she says you know 
Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So she asks him a spiritual question. Ah, I found a prophet. Now, prophet, answer my question. Which is the best place to worship? Is it Jerusalem, where all the Jews say that you have to go there? But our forefathers, they worshipped on this mountain. You tell me which is the best place. So Jesus responds to her and says, "See, it's not about the place. There's something more important than the place where you worship. It is the way in which you worship." So you know this very uh, famous. Uh, statement of Jesus where he says you know the time has come that the far the father is seeking for true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth so Jesus says it's not about where we worship but it is about the way we worship so what is the spirit worship in spirit means led by the spirit inspired by the spirit you know we worship god and spirit and in truth means Truth is the revelation of God's word. So we go by the truth, and with that we are able to worship God. So God is looking for how we worship more than where we worship. Okay. So the Father is seeking such to worship Him, and then He adds to. The uh, information that is giving her, and he's saying God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So the Father is seeking people who worship in spirit and truth, and God Himself is spirit. So again, He says, "Look, God is spirit. It's not about the place. He's not stuck right to one place. But you look at what true worship is and the attitude with which one should." Worship God. So now the the discussion has moved from something simple and natural, give me water, to where should we worship? Okay, a more deeper truth about God. So the woman tells Jesus for this reply. She says, "How uh, she's curious. I found this prophet. He told me about my life. Now he's telling me about the right way to worship. Let I better ask him that." You know that key question because you see everyone, all the Jews, they were waiting for the Messiah. So even this lady, she's not a scholar or anything, but that is the hunger of her heart. She says, "I know that the Messiah is coming. Uh, when he comes, he will tell us all things." Okay, so she is waiting to meet this Messiah and to learn. Many truths from the life of this Messiah. So Jesus kind of brought her to that point, to point her to Him. Same thing that He did to Nicodemus. Ultimately, there was a question to Nicodemus: Do you do you believe? But Nicodemus had some resistance. Here, Jesus tells this lady, "I who speak to you am He." So He introduces Himself and He says, "You don't have to wait." Lady, I am the Messiah, and I am the one. I have come from above, and I can tell you all things. Now, did this lady, this woman of Samaria, believe? At this point, the disciples come back, and they are amazed that what Jesus, you're talking to a woman. No, who talks to a woman? Yet, no one said it. Okay, what do you seek, or why are you talking to her? Nobody actually said it. And you know, when Jesus said that I am the Messiah to the woman, this lady she was so amazed that she left her water pot. It says, meaning, you know, when you're so thrilled uh, that uh, if something is happening, you know, maybe you're carrying something in your hand. You just leave it there because you're so excited. You want to go and tell everybody what you have experienced. So she's excited. She leaves her water pot. She went her way to the city and told everyone, "Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ?" 
then they went out of the city and came to him so in a way you know she is becoming the person who is spreading the good news she met the messiah and that's what happens to us when we meet the messiah you know we are so excited i found the living water you know i found uh, he told me about true worship uh, and uh, you know he told me about my life so she's excited about all these things and he told me that he's the messiah could he be the true messiah she's going around and telling people uh, how you know she has met this person you also come you also experience christ so when we are touched by you know christ in our lives we become those who proclaim christ to others so i think at this point i will just uh, you know pause because we're almost run out of time uh, but yeah these are the incidents that we see and some of the uh, realities that uh, some of the truth that comes out of it so at this point i just want to ask us now we've seen how jesus ministered to this lady okay uh, uh, we look at it as evangelism so uh, any other thoughts about evangelism bringing people to christ in addition to what we said you know we talk to them based on their situation but we introduce christ to them and then we ask for a response do you believe so anything you want to add to that about evangelism okay great so kiran says depends on the holy spirit and the knowledge of god yeah true kiran so to be led by the holy spirit we can also move in the gifts of the spirit isn't it uh, and uh, when we do that people are amazed they are willing to give their life to god because they understand this is a supernatural work of god so these are all things that we observe Uh, so at this point let's just say a word of prayer and close today's class just want to request anyone to close with a word of prayer please okay kiran do you want to pray thank you yeah sure thank you Father God, once again we just come before your throne, Father God. Father God, thanking you for revelation once again through John chapter book, Father God. Father God, thanking you for so many things we learned today, Father God. Thanking you for those all things, Father God. Father God, thanking you for ma'am and all the students also, Father God. Father God, we want more your presence in our life, Father God. To journey, Father God, we want more revelation, Father God, and we want more, Father God, your uh, wisdom and knowledge, Father God, upcoming the journey, Father God. Father. God bless to every side, Father God. Take care of every side and take care of everything, Father God. Thanking you for listening our prayer, Father God. Almighty Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you, everyone. God bless you, and uh, we'll see you in the next class. Okay. So bye for now. Yeah. Bye. Thank bye. You. God bless. Thank you. Bye.